Hi. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I am obviously Brandon Sanderson. Um, this is the writing workshop. Um, and I think, how much time do I have here? They, I have two of them back to back, right? Yeah, it's an hour. Wait, it's an hour each? I think, it, yeah, an hour and a half. Hour hour for the half hour in oh, between? Yeah. Okay. Half hour between. Okay, yeah. that works. Okay. Yeah. Um, it says we're going to do characters, then world building. I'll probably try to keep to that. But in my mind, this is really one long workshop um, where I'm going to touch on a lot more topics than that. Um, essentially, I'm going to try and give you the condensed version of my creative writing class in two hours. Uh, so 14 weeks in two hours. I don't know if I'll be able to pull it off. But I'll stick generally to characters in the first part, generally world building in the second part. Probably should have flipped those as I consider it. But um, we'll actually start by doing some things that are more basic, more general than that. Um, and I will try to blab at you for a while and then leave time for questions. Um, I do want to be able to answer questions and interact and things like that. So um, we'll see. Little background um, on me then. Let's get rid of this thing. I walk back and forth and gesture and hit stuff, and this is just freaking out. Um, I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was like 14, probably, um, which would have been 89, the year before I, the world came out. Um, and I decided I want to do this writing thing for a living. Um, I had no idea how people did this writing thing for a living, if people did this writing thing for a living. Uh, my mother said, that's nice, dear. I'm glad you, you, know, you have something you want to do. You should be a doctor and do that on the side because doctors actually make money. <laughs> um, you know, my mother, bless her heart, she's an accountant. Um, she graduated first of her class in accounting because that's a, you know, a real profession. She still it gets her, she, she just doesn't like the humanities being taught at college. Like, she's like, you can, should be able to take classes in that, but that's not a job. <laughs> and English major is not a job. It doesn't tell you. Anyway, she's got that whole thing. And so, so we love her. We do our best with her. But yeah. Um, so I went to college my freshman year in biochemistry. <laughs> yeah, you biochemist? Uh, yeah, biochemistry. Okay, cool. Well, you know, I can I can give you like a, a little bit of a fist pound because I only boom. Um, I only lasted one year. Okay, yeah, that's another good one. That's an actual real job. Um, computers. I um I lasted one year in um, in biochemistry. I love the sciences. Um, particularly, I love the concepts and talking about them. If you've read my books, that reflects in my books. Um, I have a big problem with big math things, you know, when they, when they have this problem that takes you four hours of, of stuff to solve and you've got to, I, I just don't want to do that. Um, it makes my brain hurt. Um, and so, yeah, sophomore year, I changed to English, figuring I'm young, I'm stupid. Um, when else am I going to be able to do something like this? I'm going to go try and be a writer. Because, right, somebody makes a living at this. Um, I'm going to try it. Um, I had no idea. Oh, that makes it easier. OK. Um, I had no idea. No idea at all what I was doing. I went and I got a job working a graveyard shift at a hotel um, because I figured if I had to go to work full time, which I, I, I had lost my scholarship because I did so poorly in, um, in biochemistry, um, which, you know, I didn't do terribly, but I wasn't scholarship material anymore. So I had to put myself through school, um, and I needed to work full time, and I wanted to be able to write. So graveyard shift, right? I went to, I went to work at about 10, 10.30, and I wrote from about midnight to 4 a.m. every night. Um, this was my life for about five years, um, writing during the nights. Um, and I look back at it and I say, wow, how in the world did I do that for five years? I wrote um, across the next, let's see, next about seven year period. So I, I think there was, there was another year before I went and got the Great Guide Ship. Um, but about seven year period, I wrote 13 novels, um, two books a year. 
usually a longer one and a shorter one, so like a big epic fantasy and something else, um, often two a year for seven years. Um, most of it done between midnight and 4 or 5 a.m. at the hotel. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, my textbook was the Wheel of Time, honestly. That's the only thing about, you know, I studied the books that I love to read, and I thought, well, that's how I'll do this. Um, I was probably, I was still a little bit of a, I was, I was shy about it because my mother had told me you can't do this for a living. Um, when people asked me, what are you going to do? I said, oh, I'll probably be an, an English teacher um, or something like this. Um, but in my heart, I was like, well, I finished six novels. I'm going to be a writer. But making that jump between I sit and scribble stories at night and actually sending things out and doing things with my books, that's a big leap to make. And so one of the first things I, I want to mention to you is this concept of most writers generally have split personalities because you have to see yourself as an artist and a craftsperson and a business person. And learning to be able to do all three of those things simultaneously is a big, it, it can be really, really difficult. Um, people who are only the artist, um, you see a lot of people who are only the artist in creative writing programs. I eventually started taking creative writing classes because I figured I need to know how to do this. I need to know how to actually make money off of this. I need to know what I'm doing wrong. I need to know how to write better stories. Um, people who are only the artist, um, they will write a book every five or ten years. Um, they will talk a lot about the um, the art of it, the you know letting it grow within you and nurturing the story. It's very all very metaphysical and these sorts of things. There is a component of that that's very important. Um, you do need to learn how to cultivate the artistic sense within you. You you don't want to just be quote unquote cranking them out. Um, I've, I've heard other authors talk of, yeah, I've got to crank out a book this year. I don't think you even want to refer to it in that way, because there's a, definitely an artist statistic component. But if you're only an artist, um, artists don't generally take a lot of the effort it takes to, to look at your work really critically, and they also are very bad at meeting deadlines and these sorts of things. If you want to write professionally, you are going to have to learn the craftsperson part a little bit. Now, if you're only a craftsperson, that's where you get the writers who are cranking them out. Um, to, to them, it's only just another job. I don't think this is just another job. Um, I think there is something special about a creative profession that's different, and that artistic side is, is important. But the craft side, this is where you say, you know what? I have committed to create a certain number of books a year, or every couple of years I've committed to, to doing one. I have to be willing to do the copy edits when I get them, rather than put them aside and write on some other completely different project. Um, you have to be able to train yourself to write when you need to write, rather than writing when it strikes you. Um, this can be a hard, little bit hard to do, depending, and we'll talk more about all these things. The business person is, I think, the hardest thing to reconcile, um, and it took me a long time to learn this. Uh, when I say business person, I often say, um, with me, it's like there's this writer inside my head, and I unchain him and let him do whatever he wants without really regard to market interest. I don't go and say, oh, what's selling right now? I'm going to write that. Um, if the business person were completely in control, that's all that would happen. Um, and I think that's actually a recipe for disaster because chasing the market doesn't really work. And if you really want to only make money at this, you shouldn't be writing fiction. You should be writing nonfiction, um, self-help books, diet books, or you know, chicken soup for the forehead or whatever it is you want to write. Um, because that's, what's, that's what makes the most money. Um, if you're writing fiction, you should be writing thrillers. Um, and you know, there's. You wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if you were listening only to the business person. 
Um, but the business person is important. The business person is the one who says who once you've got that book written, the book that's from your heart, um, that is you know this artistic endeavor that you just absolutely love. The business person takes the artist, locks them in the closet, runs away, away laughing with the manuscript, and says, "Now what can I do with this? How can I make some money off of it?" The business person is that piece of you that exploits the artist in any way humanly possible. Um, this is okay. It really is. The business person is the one that says, yes, the art is important, but this is also your job. And so learning to how to make your mortgage payment using this sort of stuff is important because it gives you much more time to write. Uh, if you don't have to have a day job, then you can, you can let the artist out far more often than if you did. And so um, reconciling these, kind of difficult to do. Um, you need to be strong in each area. You don't need to, be, need to be equally strong in each area. Some people balance these things differently, but you do need to pay attention to that. Um, I spent the next few years, last, last year and a half of my undergraduate, taking every creative writing class I could get into. I finally admitted to myself, um, I, had, I had come out of the writing closet, <coughs> so to speak, and I was willing to call myself a creative writer. When people asked me then what I wanted to do, I said, I am, going, I am a writer. I'm going to be a professional one. That was my, what my answer was. Um, I eventually took a class from a man named David Farland, who was teaching a class at the local um, university, AKA Dave Wolverton, they're the same person. Um, Dave Wolverton writes uh, science fiction and um, the occasional Star Wars novel. Dave Farland writes epic fantasy. Um, and he, he had some very interesting things that I needed to hear because in my creative writing classes, I had only heard about this, which was very useful, but it was the same thing over and over again, um, class after class. Dave came in and he talked exclusively about these two. Um, he came in and said, this is how you publish. This is the practice. This is the way the publishing world works. Here are some facts about publishing. One of the most important things that he said, which is the thing that I will pass on to you, is that you can do this as a job. Ignore the people who say you can't. A lot of people like to say that. I don't know why it is. Perhaps it is because it is difficult. Um, but, you know, being a doctor is difficult to ask any, you know, person who's just gone through the residency, was that easy? No, that's not going to be easy. It's the same thing for writing. It is difficult. It is hard to break in, um, but it is very possible. Um, and if you are willing to put the time and effort into it and learn all three of these things, then you will be successful. Um, I define successful as writing really great books and hopefully publishing a few of them. Doesn't necessarily mean that you will make a living at it, but you will have income from it, which, you know, getting paid to do something you love, that's awesome. Um, but the honest truth is, I would have kept writing books, perhaps not at the same rate once I had to get a real job, but I would have been writing books, I would say, one a year for the rest of my life if I never got published. That's the sort of mindset that it generally takes to actually get published. The people you see getting published most of the time are people who are working very hard, who love this, who are doing it in their free time. And you know what? That actually extends to most careers. Most computer programmers that I know, computer, computer wizards, the ones who are doing really well, are the ones that when they come home, they work on their own projects because they like it so much. Um, and whatever job it is, if you're if you're that involved in it, you really like it, it's kind of, you know, you would do it even if they weren't paying you. That's one of the roads to success in this. Um, okay, um, now I'm going to probably spell something wrong because I always do on the board. So I'm just going to... That's perseverance. You can't read that? What? That's perfectly legible. And it's spelled correctly, too. I can tell. Um, okay. Talent versus perseverance. Um, 
One of the nice things about writing, in my opinion, is that through practice and criticism, most people can get to a professional level. Um, I won't say everyone, because there are people I've met who trying to get them to change and, and learn what they need to learn is like beating your head against the wall. They're set in their ways. Um, some oftentimes, to be honest, the thing that people don't seem to be able to overcome because they don't want to are the grammar issues. Um, surprisingly, which I would think would be the easy things to learn, but the people who have problems with them say, grammar doesn't matter, only the art and, um, and the story matters. And I'm like, I can't read your art and story because I stop every other word anyway. Um, <laughs> talent versus perseverance. Talent is important. But the great thing about people is we all have talents in different areas, and you can apply a wide variety of different talents to writing. There's so much going on with writing, and you can learn to tell what you're good at and focus on your talent area and you know learn to do the other things well enough that your talent shines and you can write really great books. Um, it's very possible for you to be making a living at this. You can do it. It may take some time, but you can do it. So just keep that in mind. It is possible. Um, I had this um, this class and it included a lot of information on publishing and you know the realities of publishing world, how to network, all of these sorts of things that the artist doesn't even want to think about. Like networking, no, that's what business majors do. Artists create. Um, and but it was good advice. I went and I started networking. Um, guess what? Editors and agents are people, rather than these you know creatures crouching in their lairs and you know, rejecting manuscripts for the fun of it and, you know, using their infernal pen to write burning words. Ah, oh, you suck across a manuscript. Just, no, they're people. Um, and if they've met you and you aren't scary, that actually earns them, your, your, you know, if you've met them and talked to them and they can see that you're a real person, a real face, when you send them a manuscript, their chances of looking at it go up. Um, if you can be the craftsperson and send them a manuscript which they reject and then later on send them another manuscript which is better, a lot of them will start to take notice and then if they reject that you send them one, again they'll say, wow this person is actually capable of doing this consistently and they're getting better. Um, maybe it's time to take a chance on this person. One of the big kind of insider things I've noticed about agents and editors, very few of them talk about a book or a manuscript being good or bad. They just don't see things that way. They talk about how much work it will take to get it publishable. Every manuscript that comes across their deck, desk with the right amount of work could be a publishable manuscript. And um, in our profession, particularly our area, science fiction and fantasy, generally the, the things are not getting rejected because of their ideas. Most people who have read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and are dedicated to this and are spending the time working and writing are coming up with some pretty good ideas. Um, and so it's not that, it's the craftsperson side that's usually lacking. Um, and I'll be honest with you guys, ideas are kind of cheap. One of the things you ought to understand, ideas are cheap. The skill to turn a good idea into a good book is not. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't ideas out there that are just high caliber, this book will do well no matter how well. There are occasionally just super ideas. Maybe you have one or two of those. That's great. You know, the concept for Jurassic Park was one where you could, you could walk in and pitch that and people said, wow, that's an idea. Um, but for the most part, you know, you'll walk in and say, this is my idea. And they'll say, that's a great idea for a book. Can you write it now? Can you take that idea and turn it to a book? The science fiction and fantasy publishers in particular are looking for that. Um, everyone wants a blockbuster, but our genre is generally smaller than most of the most genres. Um, and because of this, and because of the people who are in charge, Tom Doherty, and um, when he was alive, Jim Bain, and some of these people who were, 
they were actually interested in the genre rather than just the money. Um, money's great. You know, Tom's a business person. He likes to make money for his company. But he actually legitimately loves the genre. And so what he's looking for are not necessarily blockbusters right off the bat. He is looking for authors who can create good stories and good books consistently. Because for science fiction and fantasy, that is what's going to eventually become the blockbuster. And so if you can start sending these manuscripts to editors where they say, this person can learn, and they can produce consistently, and they have the great ideas, but they need help, the editor will take a chance on you because of that feeling of, wow, you know, this is someone who can work at it and get better. Um, so remember that. Editors generally don't talk about good or bad. It's just how much work is it. And every book they're going to get is going require, to require some work. And the amount of work they're willing to put into it depends on how good the book already is, how good the ideas are, and how much they feel the author will be able to do what they say. If they can write a really great editorial letter and send it back to you, even if the first draft was terrible, if they know that they do that work, the second draft is going to come back great, they'll do it every time. Editors love doing this. People become editors because they love the idea of discovering the next timeline. They love the idea of being the one who is helping and nurturing this great art. Editors get paid terribly. They really do. Um, I was, I, even on my very first book, my very first book, where I was a nobody, a launcher, I was already earning more than my editor on that book, okay? Um, and I very quickly passed up by my, yeah, actually, Elantris, on the earnings of Elantris, I was already earning more than he earned his entire year. Um, not on just, not my advance, but if you count my royalties and things. Um, editors do this because they love it, not because, you know, they, they really legitimately want to find you guys, um, particularly in science fiction and fantasy. They are looking to discover these things. And so your job, if you want to be a writer, is to learn about the artist, craftsman, business person, and to nurture your talent, and then be doggedly persistent and work at it. Um, it takes generally about 10 years, is what I've been told. Um, and I've kind of seen this repeatedly. That's a rule of thumb. 10 years' time spent writing books and learning the publishing business is what it takes to result in getting sold and publishing and these sorts of things. Um, I did it in eight, but that's well within the, you know, I mean, my good friend Dan, who, um, if you listen to my podcast, Writing Excuses, um, is one of the voices on there. By the way, if you're interested in writing, Writing Excuses is lots of fun. You can just, you can find it on my website, you click through it. It's just me and Dan and, and Howard Taylor talking about writing. Um, Dan, took about two years, no, he, he took, let's see, his first book came out this year, and my first book came out in, um, in 05, so it took him four years longer than me, so it took him 12 years. Um, we took that same creative writing class together, and had both been writing about the same amount of time. Um, I, I was, you know, this dopey kid working a graveyard shift and living in his friend's basement. Dan had a family and went and got a real job. Um, it took him a little bit longer, but he wrote some really great books, and it was his sixth book that he sold. Launchers was my sixth book. I was writing number 13 when I sold it, um, number six. So perseverance. Be willing to stick some time into this. Be willing to say, you know, I may have to write six books. Maybe I'm going to be better than Brandon. I'll write four. You know, <laughs> that maybe you'll get really lucky, and you're a genius, and you'll publish your very first book that you write. It happens to some people. Most of us, it takes years of work and effort and learning. And I sure am glad I didn't publish my first book. In fact, most people, if it's the first book they've written and I read it, I can say, wow, this is a first book. They're going to regret this eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for Christopher Paolini. Um, his book that he wrote when he was 17 was phenomenally better than my books that I was writing when I was 17. But it's still a first book, and it feels like one. And I have a feeling that when he's in his 30s and still writing, he's probably not going to miss the paycheck. But when he looks back at those books, he's going to say, wow, you know, part of me wishes I had waited until I was writing what I am now and published that so that I didn't have to air out. You, 
I didn't have to air out my first five books and let people see them because they're terrible. Um, they're progressively less terrible, but they're still terrible. <laughs> okay, let's talk about something. That's the kind of, yeah. Okay, step number two. Let's talk about Because as a writer, one of the most important things for you to understand is that nobody does it the same way. There are as many ways to write books as there are authors out there. And so, every time you read a book, no matter who wrote it about writing, um, they are generally going to talk about the way that they do it. And that can be completely wrong for you. Or it could work for you. Your job as an aspiring professional writer um, as a, a learning writer is to say, well, this works for Stephen King. I'm going to give it a try and see if it works for me and if I like it. And if I don't, I'm going to pass that tool aside and try something else. It's all focused on what creates the best, the best books and what makes it to do it mo the most consistently. So what helps the artist create great art and what helps the craft, craft person keep at it consistently and able to produce things. One of these tools is understanding if you are a discovery writer or an outliner or something in between. Um, learning how you work as a writer is one of the great ways that the artist and the craftsperson can interact. The artist has certain methods that it uses to get into the zone, so to speak, to create these great works of art. To, to tie characters, plot, setting, all of these things together. Um, the craftsperson can say, aha, this tool helps the artist work. I'm going to make refine using this tool, and I'm going to learn and understand the methods the artist uses, and I'm going to encourage myself to find ways to use those methods more often and to be more effective with them. Great way for the two to interact. Authors tend to fall on a spectrum between the discovery writer and the outliner. Um, and there are pitfalls and foibles to each, each way. No way is necessarily better than another. Um, a lot of authors are going to fall somewhere in between. But I, I'll tell you the two extremes and the problems with them, and you can kind of look at where you are. A discovery writer is the way they try to teach you in creative writing classes. Um, in fact, I had several professors who thought this was the only way to do it. The discovery writer sits down without very many preconceived concepts about the book and says, okay, I am going to let this book grow naturally. I am going to just start writing. And I'm going to see where my writing takes me. And I'm going to give it subtle nudges as it goes along. But I'm just going to let it go. Um, this is okay. This works. For some people, I mentioned Stephen King. His book on writing um, is actually a very good book to read if you want to be a writer. It's one of the best. He mentions being a discovery writer. He generally, what he does is he comes up with an interesting situation and interesting characters, and he puts the characters in that situation, and then he sees what happens. OK? That's a discovery writer. An outliner is the polar opposite. The outliner loves to plan, um, and you know, this is the Mogetti and the book writing, right? Um, this is when you sit and you get every little piece correct, and you get, you know, you, you, you come up with all the plot lines and the threads, and you, you spend months and months world building, and you spend all this time getting everything right, and then you write the book. Um, Orson Scott Card is an outliner. If you read his books on writing, he will say things like, often I'll spend six months planning a book and two months writing it. That's an extreme outliner. 
Now, there's another word that I sometimes use for these that I've heard talked about. It. <laughs> okay. Now, this kind of expose, exposes kind of the follies of both ways a little bit more. I like to call them this because this talks about their strengths. This kind of talks about their weaknesses. But it, helps, it can help you understand what you are. Multi-drafters, discovery writers, they generally don't know where their book is going until they, you know, how their book's going to end until they get there. Which generally means that they're going to have to do a lot of drafting and a lot of work. They're going to get done with it and say, oh, now I know what this book is about. And oftentimes they will start over and rewrite it using the old version as now their outline. And they write a completely fresh draft, which works much better, and then they revise that. The problem with multi-drafters is a lot of multi-drafters like to write one chapter and then say, oh, now I know what this book is about. And then they start over and, and write another first chapter. And then they say, oh, now I know what this book is about. And they start over again and they write another first chapter. Oh, I had one person in a writing group, um, my friend Nate, who we started calling him the Eternal Rewrite as his name in capital letters because he submitted the first chapter to his novel 14 times. <laughs> drastically different every time. Like, there were 14 different books, but he's like, oh, I wrote the few chapters and I realized what I wanted to do with this book, and then he started it over and did it again. And yeah, every time. If you've ever done that, if you have, um, if, if, if you put aside a project for that reason, the outliners, there are reasons why they don't, they, yeah, they have other problems. We'll get to them. But if you're putting things aside because you're like, oh, now I know where I'm going, then, you know, you might be right that you might be a multi drafter. Uh, if you have frequent problems with um, writer's block, you might be someone who's trying to multi draft who's really an outliner. Um, if you um, have a lot of trouble with endings, you're probably a multi or a, a multi drafter. I, every multi drafter I've known has a real problem with endings um, because they're not planning them out ahead of time. They get there and they're like, oh, now what? Um, if you are a discovery writer, it's okay. Remember that it's okay. You can fix it in the next draft, but don't let yourself until you've finished it. Even if you have to get to the ending and write this really slack on ending that doesn't work, when you can write the end, then let yourself revise. Um, then sit down and say, okay, what parts of this book did I really like? What are my major themes? What are my major conflicts? How can I make an ending that deals with the major themes and conflicts? You can do that. It's okay, but remember to finish. Multi-drafters have a lot of trouble finishing. Um, but outliners can have that same problem too. I am more of an outliner. I know the foibles of out outliners more than I know them of multi-drafters. My friends who are multi-drafters, I've seen them struggle with two things. That is, getting past chapter three without going back and revising. Um, and also the um, problem with the endings. Another multi-drafter thing is that some, sometimes you just do have to pin down what you want to do with your book, rather than saying, well, I want to try it this way now, and writing a completely new book with the same characters, and then a new book, and a new book. Um, but anyway. Outliners, problems with outliners are outliners have trouble either getting past the design stage or getting um, or revising their work when they're done. Um, if you hate revision, you might be an outliner. <laughs> In fact, you probably are because multi drafters tend to love revision. They're like, ooh, I can go back and fix it now, and change, play with it, and change it, and go somewhere else. Outliners <coughs> pretend to rip through a book because they spent so long planning it, and by the time they're done, it would be like, yes, it came out majestically and perfectly, and I'm done. Or they say, oh, that turned out terribly. I don't really, you know, but the next one's going to be great. And then they sit down and start planning the next one because planning is what they love to do. Um, and so. <coughs> Outliners, you have to realize that if you want to do this professionally, you can't do it like Grandpa Tolkien did. He spent 18 years writing a book. Um, he was an extreme outliner. He wanted everything to be perfect by the time he wrote the book. Um, you've got to understand that you, so at one, some point, have to stop world building and start writing. Um, 
I have a number of friends who are extreme outliners and you know, 20 some years working on this perfect book in their head and they have never written it yet. Um, you know what, that's actually, I don't, it's hard to point a finger and say, oh, you shouldn't do that. If that's what they love doing, there's nothing wrong with that. But, the, but it's very, very, very hard to be a professional writer and making your living doing this if you're, if you're spending that long. My suggestion to those, to those people is you need to learn the craft of writing, and the only way to do that is to practice. And so divide your time, spend half of your time having fun with this project that you're going to write someday that is going to be so wonderful that it unites mankind, and <laughs> everyone reads this book and you know obtains nirvana. That's great. You can spend half your time working on that. Spend the other half of your time writing something that is practice. Give yourself a couple of weeks to world build it. That'll make you cringe if you're a one drafter, but a couple of weeks and then sit down and force yourself to write every day on it until you are done. Because there are certain aspects of this, particularly plotting, that you can't learn except by doing. It's very hard to teach plot without you have to go, going through and trying it. And it's very hard to learn plot without finishing an entire novel length work. Um, you can learn short, by short stories. The problem with short stories is there aren't any markets for short stories anymore. There are a couple of magazines. They're really good magazines, but they, they don't really make very much money and don't have very many subscribers anymore. And um, you can't make a living as a short story author anymore. Just because the short fiction market, for whatever reason, has imploded and people don't read the magazines. Who here subscribes to any science fiction magazines? Okay. Um, how, who here has, has bought a novel of science fiction or fantasy in the last year? Okay, there's our <laughs> proof of concept right there. If you love, write short, sh love short stories and love writing them, go for it. Do it because you love it, not because you want to make, make money at it. It is still a great way to learn some things about craft, but you can defy the conventional wisdom of 10 years ago and jump feet first in by writing novels, and if that's what you read, that's what you should be writing. Don't write stuff you don't read. Very important to remember. Um, so, one drafters, you have to start, and one drafters, you have to revise. This was my big problem. I didn't have trouble starting, because while I love the world building process, um, I had whipped into me by my grandmother and mother this pioneer work ethic, um, which means you have to be doing something, and outlining has never felt like doing something to me. Um, I am kind of, I get kind of itchy if I'm not actually producing pages. Um, and so I will usually give myself a couple of months to world build and outline depending. Um, Way of Kings, I took about eight months. That was long for me. Um, that was maybe too long, but I, you know, anyway. I, I then started writing. It also depends on how long of a series I'm planning on writing, how much I feel background wise I need to have. Um, so anyway, started writing, got done, and said, that book was okay. I can do better. And then I started a new one. And I got done with that and said, that book was, was a little bit better, but I can do even better and started a new one. And I did this repeatedly. I never started sending things off until I had written my sixth and seventh books. Until Dave like, kicked me in the pants and said, you want to make a living at this, you've got to send your books to somebody. <laughs> um, duh, yeah, okay. Um, so until then, I really hadn't done anything like that. Um, and I had real tr troubles convincing myself that I needed to revise. Once I got over the revision hurdle, I got published really quickly, relatively. Um, it was only about a year and a half um, to two years after I figured out how to revise, learned the process, studied it, sat down and practiced it, that I started producing works that were, that were publishable. Um, so, yeah, one drafters. Those are the things that you need to be paying attention to. I am actually right here on this list, um, this, this thing. I outline my settings and my plot extensively. I discover to write my characters. Um, I feel that for me, this just, number one, it just works. But number two, I like it, get, that it gives the sense of realism to my characters who are learning and growing, and I am learning and growing along with them. Um, I, I feel that it gives an organic, um, life to my characters by letting them experience. Like, I plan out all events, and the way I'm thinking of it in my mind is all these events are happening, but I don't know how these people are going to react to them. 
and how they react to them could dramatically change, actually, the rest of the events. I always let my outline be loose, and if, it's, if I feel that a character has changed to the point that they would do something that the app is against the outline, I go with what the character would do, and I rebuild the outline. Um, that's easy to do, that's fine. Um, I would suggest if you're an outliner, always be willing to change the outline if something better comes along, particularly if you feel the character would do a certain thing against the outline because that's who the character is. In that case, you need to do what the character would do or you need to go back and, and revise until the character is the right person. And sometimes that's the appropriate thing to do. But anyway, keep that in mind. Um, that's what I do. Um, I think it works pretty well. Um, I, I, looking over the notes and materials, I feel that, that, um, that Jim did this a lot. Um, he may have actually um, been a, an outliner for his world building and a discovery writer for both character and plot in a lot of cases. Um, he knew big events were what going to happen. He would work out how to get there as the characters interacting would influence him to do that. So anyway, but find what works for you. There's no right way to do this. Okay, there's no one right way to do this. There are definitely lots of wrong ways, but okay. So, how much time do I have left? Fifteen. Fifteen, okay. Um, let's start talking about the big three. I gave you 45 minutes of background. Hopefully that's useful to you. Plot, setting, character. A book is the interaction of these three, okay? Um, Really, I have to say that the thing that glues all three of these together is conflict. Conflict. Conflict is what makes a story. All right? Conflict is what makes us interested in characters. Conflict is what draws us into the plot. Conflict inherent in the setting is generally the best way to world build. Um, I will use the Wheel of Time as an example because I'm assuming all of us have read it. Um, what? What? Yeah. <laughs> setting. Is there conflict inherent in the Wheel of Time setting? No. Yes, there is. He is built into the, the political system and the social system inherent conflict. The magic system has inherent conflict. If you use it and you're a guy, you go insane. That is legitimately one of the most brilliant <coughs> world building concepts I've ever seen because of the inherent conflict, the way it ties setting and plot and character all together with one conflict. You can say that alone and it's a world building concept It evokes an entire magic system. It's a character concept because the person who's going to be having to deal with this has this huge conflict. Do I use magic or do I go ins and go insane or do I just let people I love die? Wow, okay, and it's got inherent plot hooks in it, okay? Do you, you know, you're discovering the learning, the magic, there's a plot in there, conflict. Conflict is what makes this all work, okay? Plot set in character. Your plot is your <laughs> sequence of events, but you're looking for interesting conflicts in your sequence of events. Your characters are, you want to have interesting quirky characters, but you want to be looking for the way they are in conflict with the plot or the setting. Um, and the setting, you yeah, want, want to be really interesting, but you want to keep your eyes on, okay, how are these different selling out of elements going to rub against each other? You know, how am I going to, how am I going to deal with having the white cloaks and the Aes Sedai? Well, inherent conflict. You put them in conflict with each other, so they rub against each other, and therefore, one of the best things to do is create characters who are at the centers of this conflict. Um, if you want to create great characters, you want to have them in conflict, and you also want to have them be active. These are that, these are not this, I say these things and people usually are like, oh yeah, of course. It's harder than you think. Uh, particularly if you like to write young adult or middle grade, you will find yourself naturally writing inactive characters. It's just one of the big problems with writing about children <coughs> is things tend to happen to them. And at the beginnings of your books, generally, um, if, you, if, you, if you like to study the three-act format, I'm not a big three-act formatter. 
Um, it feels a little bit, it, 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 it's a tool that certain people like. I don't like saying that you have to follow it because I don't follow it and I feel that anytime someone says you must do this, that that's a recipe for disaster because you have to be able to use which tools you want. And I think thread format is too limiting um, for, for writing, but it is definitely a tool some people like and it does work. Uh, and the, the concept for three act plotting is the idea that chap act one things happen to the character, act two the character tries to resolve those things and makes them worse, and act three they try to resolve the things and actually fix them. Um, it's kind of the way that people approach that. Generally at the beginning your characters are going to be inactive. Things are going to happen to them. This is the great comp problem with being a, a heroic type of character is that the heroic type of character, there is no need for that hero if there is nothing wrong. And so, by definition, the hero is going to sit at home at his, in his or her house and be perfectly happy, you know, being a sheep herder for the rest of their life, except something goes terribly wrong and they have to step up and fix it. Which means something has to be terribly wrong first, which means the hero is generally reacting against the villain, which is something to be aware of and to be concerned with. You don't want the hero only just reacting. At some point, your hero um, is going to have to step up and say, I am taking ownership of this conflict and I'm going to try and fix it. This is the sort of thing that makes readers stand up and cheer because they've been waiting for somebody to do that for so long. Um, so keep that in mind. You don't want everything only to happen. You want them to be active, even if it's in small ways. Um, even if you, know, you look at the beginning of I, and yeah, you got Trollocs attacking the two rivers, um, and, but um, Jim was able to work in, is Bran proactive in the first two chapters? Yeah, he kills a Trolloc, he I takes his dad, who's, you know, who's nearly much. dead, and gets him to safety. I mean, he is reacting, but he is doing things. He's not just sitting there and letting other people do things. And that's a big danger, particularly in fantasy, is letting other people come in and fix your problems for you. You want to make the characters fixing the problems. Now, they don't always have to do a good job of it. That's okay. Um, in fact, a lot of times they should do a bad job of it. <clears throat> a guy named Terry Grossio, who, um, if you want to read some great essays on writing, go look up his web website, Word, Word Player, I think. Anyway, just Google Terry Grossio. He's a screenwriter. Um, he's written a lot of really great screenplays. Um, the Aladdin screenplay with his, his, his partner, they, um, they write together. Um, and the Pirates of the Caribbean screenplays, just lots of stuff. He has um, um, this thing where he says, the best characters in his opinion are the characters who try and try and try and try and try good things and try smart things and fail anyway. Um, he uses the example of Indiana Jones at the beginning of the first Indiana Jones movie, right? Yeah. Indy tries really hard to get that little statue thing. He struggles. He, you know, he is smart, he is strong, you know, he does the balancing thing, he, you know, he's whipping across things, and everything still goes wrong, and he runs out of there working as hard as he can, he survives and he still loses the statue thing. At the end of that little introduction, you love Indiana Jones. <laughs> Why? Because we want our characters to be proficient yet flawed. Okay. In other words, we you characters kind of run on this little scale between Superman and Everyman. <coughs> And depending on the plot and the type of story you're writing, how far on one side of the scale you want to be, really just, it depends. There's no really set thing, but there is a sweet spot in here where you've got a superhero of a character who at the same time feels very relatable. Indiana Jones is one of these. He works perfectly because when you, Indy feels like this normal guy with some superhero heroic attributes. Okay, five minutes. I, I may go, you know. I'm, That's fine. Yeah, who knows what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll probably take a break and then I'll just start blabbing and stuff. Okay. And, okay.
MD feels like this. Um, uh, Spider-Man is a great example of walking the line between superhero and everyman. Um, Rand is a great example of this as well, um, I feel. The, I, the concept is, we, as, as writers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build sympathetic characters. Now, there are times when you don't want sympathetic heroes. We call those anti-novels and anti-heroes. Um, if you want to write those, that's a different class entirely. I am talking about writing sympathetic characters, books that where you read it and you say, I want to read more about this character, I like them. Um, and in that case, you are looking to bundle up proficiency with hindrances, with flaws. Um, if you want to build sympathy for, the, for a character, one of, the, one of the best ways is to make them good at something. Okay? They should be good at something. They should be very good at something. Even if that's something they're good at doing is simply being the most loyal best friend who's ever existed, <laughs> then you've got Samwise Gam Gamgee, all right? One of the most sympathetic and beloved characters in fantasy fiction, all he's good at is being doggedly loyal. But he is a superhero at that. <laughs> he is as good at that as, you know, as uh, as Spider-Man is at flipping and jumping around between buildings, Sam is good at being loyal. You want your characters to be good at something. We, we as readers, have this thing where we like to read and say, okay, I, want, I see in this character stuff that I want to emulate, things I want to have. That makes us sympathetic to them. I want to be as brave as this character, or I want to have the superpowers that this character has, or I want to be as good at social interaction is this character. Yet at the same time, we want to feel like we identify with that character, and that's where the everyman comes in. You want to make sure, most of the time, that your character is also identifiable. Sometimes, depending on the genre, I mean, Dirk Pitt is not very identifiable. Any of you guys read those books? I think they're a blast. They're fun to read, but I don't go home and think about Dirk Pitt in the same way I go home and think about Maury. Um, because those are just superhero. Yeah, she's told me too. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'll see if I let them go. <laughs> you can come back in half an hour. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, What's that? They need to eat? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. no I'll, I'll finish this off. I may go like five minutes long or something, and we'll come back and I'll talk more about characters, and then I'll go on the world building. What's that? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good at something. Characters being good at something is going to build sympathy automatically. But also giving them flaws and handicaps. Flaws and handicaps I regard differently. A flaw is something within the character that they need to learn and overcome, which the villains will exploit. The handicap is something that's not their fault, and you can't, they're not really going to overcome in the plot arc. It's just something like you know, having a, a nice, old, kindly ant that you have to take care of, and the villains are going to exploit it. Um, <laughs> these are things that are going to, why do I say the villains are going to exploit it? Conflict. You don't want someone to have a flyer handicap that someone doesn't say, aha, there's a problem, there's something there. I'm going to make use of that to try and get at them. But, Everybody, we all have things that we're not as good at. We all have flaws, we all have handicaps. If you're writing a story about a football player, um, making you know, a one-armed football player, there's a handicap. You know, it's not like the football player did anything wrong. They, they have one arm. Okay, there's a big handicap. Um, Tom Marilyn blimping, that's a handicap. Having Aunt May is a handicap. Um, you know, Superman just being too darn honest is a handicap. That's not a flaw, that's a handicap. That's something he has to work with him. The Aes Sedai three oaths are handicaps. It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad things. In fact, they, they're very good things. But they are things that can be exploited by the enemies. They are things the characters have to work with. Flaws, on the other hand, are things like, I'm an ignorant peasant boy, and I need to get over that. Or, um, I, you know, Ran through the first two books. I don't want to stand up and, and face my destiny. It's just destiny. It's too hard to handle that. 
That's a flaw. It's a character flaw that we build character arcs around overcoming these things so that characters grow. Whether you're a one-drafter or a multi-drafter, it doesn't matter. You want your characters to start off with things that they as people can work on and get better at and overcome because that gives us character growth. Um, you want character arcs. You want character growth. You want people to learn and progress. And this will also make your character sympathetic because it will give this everyman quality, right? Um, I think looking at every one of the characters in the Wheel of Time, you could look at them and say, okay, here are some of their handicaps, here are some things they're really good at, and here are some of their flaws that they need to work and overcome. Um, so, a couple of down and dirty tricks. There are down and dirty tricks, meaning, I mean, down and dirty just means quick and simple ways to, to build reader sympathy. These are the two things you want to focus most of your time on. But you also can, sidekicks are great for building sympathy. Because you do not want the main character to talk about how awesome they are. But if their friend can think they're really awesome, you will think they're really awesome. If you can see that someone has friends and is liked by their friends, you will immediately start to like them more yourself. As, um, as a reader. And if you can see through someone's viewpoint and that person's viewpoint is saying, wow, this person is just really good at this thing and they're just a really good person and I wish I could be more like them, you will be like, yeah, yeah, I like them too. I can see that. So it's just like, you know, having a wingman when you're, 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 you're going out, you know, looking for chicks who can talk about how awesome you are. Um, it's the same sort of philosophy, right? Um, you want to have pals. You can have pals and psychics. You don't have to do this, but it's one way. Um, there's another way, this is... For a long time in screenwriting, there was this, um, this adage um, that if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted the, the, the audience to know someone was a villain, you had them kick a dog. And if you wanted them to know that someone was a hero, you had them pet a dog. Uh, um, and it, um, it's a larger concept than that. If you show your character being nice to, you know, something as simple as petting a puppy or something as simple as being nice to someone that other people are being mean to, it will build sympathy. Um, I actually remember, I don't know if, um, if Tad Williams actually knew these adages or if it was just by happenstance. Anyone here read Dragon Bone Chair? Okay, Dragon Bone Chair. Um, near the beginning, there's, um, there's a scene where Simon is in the, the palace, and you know you you see the two king's sons, the two princes are like at dinner, and Simon is feeding this poor little runt puppy, and he Tad tells us which one is the evil brother because the puppy walks over to beg, and the evil brother steps on his neck and breaks it. Um, like it's one of the early chapters. It's just now looking back, it's so blatantly obvious to me that oh, he wants us to know this is the bad guy. But you know, some of those blatantly obvious things work really well. And boy, I hated that guy throughout the whole series, and so it worked really well. Um, all because he stepped, you know. And we saw Simon feeding this puppy, who is the runt. And you know he's just a, a, um, a kitchen boy, but he's feeding the puppy. And we're like, oh, Simon, you're such a nice guy. Oh, evil prince, you broke the puppy's back. Well, you're such a you're such a good guy. So um, we will start when we when we come back with the most. <laughs> Uh, we will start when you come back. We will talk about um, how to build characters by using viewpoint, which is probably the most important thing about character to learn. Okay? And then we'll go into world building.